So I thought the best way to start our second video on hurricanes here was to start up with some review questions. And here's the first one. If the hurricane name list for this year starts with a female name, what will be the name of the 15th name system of the year? Will it be a male or a female name? Think about it. Now, if the first one is female, that means all of the odd numbered uh, named tropical systems will be female. So the 15th will be female. Remember the names alternate between male and female. How about this question? Imagine it was October 20th, 2025 and the Atlantic had already had six named tropical systems. Compare with the historical average, is this season average, above average, or below average? Now to get the answer to this one, let's think about it. It's October 20th. The peak in the hurricane season is on September 10th, so we are quite a bit beyond that. You know, we're basically a month and 10 days past the peak. Now, a normal hurricane season has 12 named systems. We get to the letter L in the alphabet here. We've only had six, and we're past the peak. This is a below average season. Does that make sense? It all has to do with what average means, which is 12 named systems. And my last question is this one. When a hurricane rapidly intensifies, what happens to the air pressure in the hurricane eye? Does it A, rapidly decrease, B, rapidly increase, or C, remain constant? So the question is, when a hurricane rapidly intensifies, what does the pressure do? Increase, decrease, or stay constant? Well, the answer to this one is most certainly A. It rapidly decreases. And let's talk about that. You see, the animation that's on top there shows you what happens to the air around a low pressure system. It spirals inward and then rises rapidly in the atmosphere. And that's what gives us all the inclement weather. But I want you to show, I want to show you Hurricane Felix. This was back in 2007. You see, I got a graph here with two Y axes. And one of them is sustained wind speed. That's the one that's over here on the left. And the other one is pressure. And I've color-coded them accordingly. Do you see how when Felix had a dramatic drop in air pressure in its eye, that was the time they went from category two strength all the way up to category five. You see these dramatic drops in pressure. In fact, Felix set a record at the time as the fastest drop in pressure over a 12 hour time period, dropping 50 millibars, taking it from cat two to cat five in that short amount of time. So when we think about hurricanes, we're always talking about how deep of a low pressure center that they have. Okay, we need to talk about what triggers hurricanes. So we're gonna come back to this map, which we saw in the first lecture, which is showing you major hurricane track history. What we see is that the hurricanes kind of basically stick inside of those two white arrows. But why do they come off of Africa? Well, across the central part of Africa, between the rainforest and the uh, Sahara Desert, there's this region where there's a lot of tropical thunderstorm activity. And these thunderstorms, as they come off of the uh, west coast of Africa, kind of sit in between these two wind belts. The little arrows I'm animating for you right here, these are the trade winds. They go from the east to the west. The big arrows I animated a moment ago are the westerlies. Our wind belts zigzag back and forth across the, uh, across the world. Now, the trade winds often meander north and south as they wiggle across the open kind of equatorial uh, Atlantic region. And it, what happens is these thunderstorms form off of the west coast of Africa, and they follow the trade winds. And they deepen whenever there's surface convergence in the winds causing the air to rise. And they make these massive clusters of thunderstorms which can evolve into tropical systems, like tropical storms, tropical depressions, and hurricanes. So it's these easterly waves coming off of Africa. Now what I want you to remember here is that we call this region the main development region for hurricanes. It's from Western Africa through the open Atlantic, getting into the Western Atlantic here, Gulf of Mexico, which is here in the Caribbean. This is the area that we watch. And you might hear them talking like on the Weather Channel or on, you know, uh, you might see from the National Hurricane Center, they keep referring to easterly waves. They're just talking about these waves in the easterly trade winds as they move across the open Atlantic to trigger these storms. Now, Hurricane Patricia, 2015, this was in the uh, Eastern Pacific, but it was the most powerful hurricane ever observed in the whole of the Western Hemisphere. And I want to get into a discussion about this. Why do hurricanes spin? And why do they spin in certain directions? And why in the Northern Hemisphere do they spin counterclockwise? That's the question we want to try to answer. So it might come back to this question. I'm just curious what you think. True or false? Water will drain in a different direction in a toilet bowl in Australia when compared to the United States. 
Now, if you're you know been in the United States for a while, you probably heard of this concept where if you take your toilet and you know flush it, it'll flush in one direction where we live here in the U.S. or I live here in the U.S. Uh, and then and then flush in a different direction in the southern hemisphere, like in Australia. And the question is, is that true or false? While I often pull my students in my face-to-face -face class this question, we get about 70% of people that say it's true and about 30% that say that it's false. And it's very interesting because after we talk about this, we watch this video. And this video shows this guy here uh, in, in Uganda. And he's right on the equator. And he performs this experiment for a small crowd. He has this, uh, basically this funnel. Underneath there's a bucket. And he's pouring water from the bucket into the funnel, plugging it up with his finger. Now you can see that on the bucket there's an arrow that's painted just like this. And what he does is he gets the water still with this little, uh, kind of the, this sheet of paper, this piece of cardboard that he's got here. And then he drops a little flower petal into it. And they zoom in and kind of show you that the flower petal spins as the water drains out of this hole. And most certainly it drains in this direction, the direction the arrow that's on the, um, on the funnel does. Then they uh, all get up and they leave. They cross the equator and go over to another experiment on the other side of the equator where they have another funnel where he pours the water in, stills the water, and then drops a flower petal in. And look at this. The arrows indicate that the water will spin in a different direction, and sure enough, that petal spins in a different direction. And then they go on the equator, and they pour water into this funnel, and he stills the water, and he pulls out the thing, and the water doesn't spin at all. It just kind of floats there and goes down this big opening, and eventually the flower even gets sucked into the middle of this one, where it doesn't in the previous two. And at the end of the video, it basically says, are you convinced? Are you convinced that this is a factor? Now, I have a question about this, all right? If the Coriolis force, which is ultimately what we're talking about here, which is a force that results in the rotation of the Earth, if the Coriolis force is strong enough to the effect the uh, rotation or the way that water drains in a toilet or in a funnel in a sink, if it's different in different hemispheres, we would feel it all the time. You'd feel it when you walk. In fact, in the Northern Hemisphere, we would actually probably develop such that we'd have one leg shorter than the other so that we could walk in a straight line if there's always this force pulling us in one direction or the other. Uh, we would be able to see it if we did something like roll a ball across the floor or, you know, putt a ball on a, on a green in golf. We'd have to account for the Coriolis effect. Or, uh, you know, a baseball player, when they hit a baseball, would have to account for the trajectory uh, difference because of the Coriolis, uh, Coriolis effect. Or, uh, you know, a football player throwing a football or, or kicking a soccer ball, you know, whatever it is. So as I leave the screen up here and ask you, are you convinced? I'm going to tell you this. This entire experiment is a sham. Now, here's how we'd better perform the experiment. Here we are here in the Northern Hemisphere where he says that it's gonna circulate in this way. If I were here in this crowd, I'd say, you know what? To better perform this experiment, which is supposed to test this idea, let's go back to the Southern Hemisphere and take this funnel with us. I guarantee you that if you do this, when you get to the Southern Hemisphere, the water will still drain in the same direction that the arrows are pointed on this funnel. The funnel is designed to drain that way. And why is the water still in this last one? Why does it not cause the flower to spin? Well, they made the hole so big, the water drains so fast, and he makes the water perfectly still that it doesn't even take on any spin. I've tested this in my bathroom, in the bathtub with my five-year-old. We filled it up, we let the water drain down, it drained in one direction. I put my hand in it, started spinning it in another direction, and it went that direction with no problem. In fact, we tested it 10 different times, the water went down the drain five times one way and five times the other. So this effect is negligible. The effect of the rotation of the Earth is negligible on small scales. So if you were convinced by what the story I just told, at least uh, that we saw here in Uganda, I'm gonna tell you something, it's totally a sham. Now, to understand this better, I want you to think about this merry-go-round. Now, merry-go-round here, let's do this. <clears throat> let's get the merry-go-round spinning in that direction. That's counterclockwise. Now, if you were to stand right here where I placed this X, and the merry-go-round is spinning rapidly around like this, if you walk from here, or take a big step from here to there, let's call it two-thirds of the way in and land at that point, I guarantee you, you're gonna fall. The question is which way you're going to fall. Do you think you're going to fall forward? Do you think you're going to fall backward? Do you think you're going to fall to the right? Or do you think you're going to fall to the left? Think about it. Got an answer in your head? You might be surprised to find out that if you're out here and the merry-go-round is spinning around counterclockwise and you step from this location in toward the middle, 
you are going to fall to the right. And I guarantee that. Now, why? Out here on the edge, that's the fastest rotating part. You're far from the center of rotation. You have a big radius and a fast velocity. Your momentum, your angular momentum is very high. When you step in toward the middle, you're going to take with you that high momentum. But you're going to be moving to a spot on the rotation of the mare ground that has lower angular momentum. And as a consequence, when you get here, the angular momentum of your feet where they land will be lower than what your body is. And to conserve momentum, you're going to fall to the right. Go to the middle. In here where you have very low angular momentum, as you step out, you're going to be stepping into a region that is higher angular momentum. As a consequence, to conserve momentum, you're going to go this direction which is still to your right when you walk from the middle to the outside. Now, both situations you fall. Don't ever do this. Don't ever stand on the outside of the merry-go-round and then try to walk with the rotation. If you do to conserve momentum, you will then be thrown off the merry-go-round because you increase your velocity. To conserve momentum, you must increase your radius. You'll get flung off. But if you're here and you walk this direction, you'll fall inward. That's because to conserve momentum when walking against the rotation, you'll have to go closer to the radius of rotation. Now, if all that is just kind of a mess in your brain, here's what I want you to take away from it. The merry-go-round was spinning counterclockwise. And in each situation, no matter how you moved, you fell to the right. You need proof? One of my students did this for me. Are you ready? You saw in both situations, when she walked in, she fell to her right. When she walked back out, she fell to her right. If she were to do this and walk this way off the edge, she'd get flung off. Or if she walked the other way, she'd fall toward the middle. No matter what, because it's rotating counterclockwise, she falls right. Need further proof? One of my former teaching assistants, Amanda, is going to throw a ball. Watch this. When she rolls the ball, see that? came all the way back around to her other side. That is incredible to see, right? That ball, if you think about it, is always falling to the right. It's turning right the whole time. The reason, the merry-go-round is spinning counterclockwise. And that's the key. Now, what's the point of all of this? Well, on Earth, we're not a merry-go-round. We're a sphere. But as you move on this sphere, you're continually changing your position with respect to the axis of rotation of the Earth. Therefore, if you can move great distances on Earth or at great speeds on Earth, the Coriolis effect is very important. At short distances and slow speeds, the Coriolis effect is negligible. That's why when you go for a walk, you don't constantly feel this tug to the right. Because from the top down, looking at the you know top down of, uh, of our planet from the North Pole, Earth rotates counterclockwise. That's why the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Now let's put it all together, all right? We have two main factors that control the wind speed. We're going to ignore friction here. We have our pressure gradient force. And the pressure gradient force can be seen in the contour lines up here. But the winds in a hurricane respond to that pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. See how they get faster and faster as you get closer? You can see that those winds cross isobars and spiral into the middle. Why is that? Well, you know what the pressure gradient force is from our pressure lectures. It's a change in pressure over change in distance equals the PGF, pressure gradient force. It's always directed from high to low. It acts perpendicularly to the isobars. And the spacing of the isobars tells you the wind speed. Now, what is the Coriolis effect? Well, you can think about it a couple different ways. I just kind of gave you a quick explanation, but look at this funnel here. We see these funnels all over the place, right? You put a coin in it in the water, or, sorry, the coin kind of goes around and around and around into the funnel before it falls out and goes in the bottom. Now, as this happens, the speed of the coin is basically affected by two things, the centripetal force flinging it out and gravity pulling it in, and there's a balance. But ultimately, friction causes it to eventually spiral into the middle. Now, this is just another way of thinking about this. What we're going to do is get rid of the centripetal force in this case and talk about it with respect to the Coriolis force. Because ultimately, what the Coriolis force is, is just a balance between the horizontal component of gravity and the horizontal component of the centripetal force, which is the force trying to fling you off of Earth. All right, check it out. 
See that hurricane in the bottom? I put a bunch of concentric circles showing you the pressure gradients. There's higher pressure all around the hurricane and lower pressure in its center. So the winds want to do that. And the reason why those yellow arrows get longer is because as you get into the tighter pressure gradient, the closer the spacing of the isobars, they have to get faster. If Earth didn't spin, we wouldn't have hurricanes. Higher air pressure would just always fill in lower pressure. But we do have a spinning Earth. And the effect of the Coriolis force is this. It will deflect the motion of the air to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern. And the amount of that deflection is proportional to the wind speed. It has zero effect on the equator and its maximum effect on the poles. And that's because the equation for the Coriolis force is 2 times omega, which is the rotational velocity of the Earth, times v, the speed of the object moving, times the sine of latitude. And what is the sine of zero? It's zero. Therefore, there's no effect on the equator. What's the sine of 90? 1. That's why there's a maximum effect on the poles. So let's figure this out. Let's back out these winds. And we know that the pressure gradient wants to take them into the middle. But they get turned to the right. And the blue arrows show you how it gets turned to the right. And they still get faster because of the Coriolis force. But now the winds orbit in a counterclockwise direction. This is why hurricanes in the northern hemisphere circulate counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, everything is reversed. The Coriolis force is to the left, and therefore the hurricanes spin clockwise there. Pretty neat to see this. This is a central idea through the rest of the semester. We're going to talk about why other weather systems spin, and in a few minutes, how it's this spin that impacts the most powerful parts of any hurricane. So let's talk about those. I've got a few different images here. We've got a picture from the International Space Station of Hurricane Elena, 1985. We have a Doppler radar view of Hurricane Aaron from 1995. And then uh, NOAA put together this kind of schematic, this diagram here of, of a hurricane cut in half. It's a cross section. I need you to know three key features. In the middle, there's a clear eye. That is where the lowest atmospheric pressure is found. It's also calm in there. But surrounding it, is basically the worst weather on Earth. The eye wall, which surrounds the eye, is the most intense part of the hurricane. It's a relatively small area, but it is incredibly intense. And feeding into this are these spiral rain bands. You can see them in all three images. These spiral rain bands help build the system and feed it. In fact, if you looked at a hurricane without this dense cirrus cloud sheet on top, it looks like you grabbed an octopus and spun it, each one of the legs being, or the, the tentacles being, you know, one of these rain bands. So we have the eye, surrounded by the eye wall, surrounded by spiral rain bands. Okay, this next bullet point is crucial should you ever decide to live on the coast where there are hurricanes. I've got Hurricane Ivan here, 2004. The red arrows tell you how it was circulating, counterclockwise. We now know why. It was moving north. The strongest winds, where we have hurricane force winds, are all inside of this donut. And I've zoomed in on it. I put a star here so that you can understand that it's the right-hand side of any hurricane that is the most powerful side. Now, a few years ago, there was a song that came out. It was a hip-hop song, right, uh, by this band called Baby Bash. And this group came out, and they sang this song called uh, a Cyclone, right? And it's about this woman who dances like a cyclone. I have no idea what it looks like to see a woman dance like a cyclone, but I can imagine, and I'm guessing, she's spinning. Now, if she's truly behaving like a cyclone, like the song says, okay, you stay away from her right-hand side. Why is that? Well, look, if the hurricane's traveling in that direction and it's rotating like this, on this side, the right-hand side, the forward motion of the hurricane is adding to the rotation. And therefore, on this side, you have your strongest winds, greatest storm surge, and worst part of the hurricane. The left-hand side, you see the rotation is going in this way while the motion is going that way, so the winds are weaker on the left-hand side. The right-hand side over here is the most powerful side of any hurricane. So if you're living in a location where a hurricane's coming toward your location and the eye is going to pass to your left, such that the hurricane, the right-hand side of it hits you, you're in trouble. Right-hand side is the worst. So stay away from any person who's trying to dance like a cyclone, especially the right-hand side, because they're going to hit you pretty hard as they spin around. Okay, let's move into it. Check this out. Hurricane Ike, 2008. There's the spiral rain bands feeding into the main eye, or the eye wall, and you can see the clear eye in the center. Now, it directly hit Galveston. One side of Ike hit this part of Galveston over here. The other side hit this part of Galveston over here. 
You see the differences over here versus over here was the left-hand side versus the right-hand side. And I'm going to show you what happened. See this picture? That's the left-hand side of Ike. Do we have storm surge? Yes. Was there flooding? Yes. But notice, those houses which are up on stilts, they survived. No major destruction. Because on this side, the rotational winds were in the opposite direction of the translational winds. In other words, the direction the hurricane moved. Want to see the right-hand side? Well, it did have houses like this, but now it looks like that. All the houses, except for this one, were completely destroyed up and down this city street here. Wiped out. Right-hand side versus left-hand side. And no, I have no idea what that guy did that kept his house safe. He was just extremely lucky. But here you can see the difference between the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Now, let's talk about this eye. What you're looking at here is a screen capture from the movie The Day After Tomorrow. Half a billion dollars in the box office in 2004. And you see these three lights? Those are the lights of helicopters who just flew through the eye wall of a massive hurricane. Here's what they look like a few moments later. Now, this is amazing. This is pretty good. This is really good, really great computer-generated graphics of a hurricane. In fact, from the top down, you're looking into the eye. They're even showing how hurricanes work. You see, hurricanes have clear eyes because air descends in the eye of the hurricane. When I was watching this movie back in 2004, though, and I was seeing this, I was like, no, wait a second. One, we don't fly helicopters into the eyes of hurricanes. Two, the hurricane structure they put here in the movie was phenomenal. But three this started to happen. You see, they showed the inside cockpit and all of a sudden all this ice started to accumulate. And this particular helicopter froze over and crashed first. Then the other helicopters, they started to ice up and then they began to crash. Look at all the ice that was forming here. And this guy screams, ah, okay. And then the helicopter crashes into the ground, into all the snow. And the guy, as he opens up the door, freezes as he breathes in the really, really cold air. And basically, I looked exactly like this guy, my mouth hanging wide open, basically saying in my head, what the heck was that? This is not how hurricanes operate. In fact, the movie The Day After Tomorrow, in addition to being one of the worst applications I have ever seen of understanding climate change, which shows 30,000 years of climate change happening in a weekend, it is also a movie that shows the largest violation I've ever seen of the first law of thermodynamics. And this is why. Why do hurricanes have eyes? There's two big reasons. One, air descends in the eye of a hurricane. You have extremely low air pressure at the bottom, and that weakens the vertical pressure gradient, allowing gravity to pull the air down slowly. Plus, there are circulation patterns around the eye wall that force air to descend in the eye. As air descends, it warms. It compressionally warms. That evaporates clouds, clears out the sky, and you have a bunch of heat that's released from the cloud uh, edge of the cloud wall as well. So long story short, the eye of a hurricane is clear and warm, not cold. Let me take this a step further. You see, I got this diagram here showing you the circulation in the eye of a hurricane. See the arrows going down here? On the eye wall, they're spiraling rapidly and ascending, but in the eye, they descend. First law of thermodynamics tells us this. 10 degrees Celsius per kilometer. That's 10 degrees per kilometer, that's a rate at which air cools it as it ascends and warms as it descends, that goes down. Okay, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's make the hurricane from the ground all the way up to here, 20 kilometers tall, 20 kilometers. If air were to descend from this spot here and go down in the eye wall, compressing as it does so, let's calculate what its temperature would be. You see, if air descends in the eye from the top of the hurricane down to the sea surface, that will cover 20 kilometers in vertical distance, compressionally warming the entire trip. Well, if it's going to warm 10 degrees every one of those kilometers, by the time it hits the surface, well, let's do this. Let's say it starts off here at minus 100 degrees Celsius. That is very cold. We can get air that cold up there. As it descends, warming 10 degrees every kilometer, by the time it gets down to the surface, it will be 100 degrees Celsius. And that, just in case you forgot, is where water boils at sea level. That would have ended the movie. It would have been fantastic in my opinion. They got it entirely wrong. They even said that air came from the mesosphere and that doesn't happen. This is just some movie magic getting thermodynamics all wrong. Hurricane 
eyes are warm. Check out this enhanced infrared satellite image. Now I know it's going to be confusing because the red colors in here are actually cold temperatures. Don't ask me why the color bars are reversed, but they are. These storm tops were at a minus 130 Fahrenheit. In the eye right there, they measure temperatures at 10,000 feet above ground level. In the eye of Patricia at 90 Fahrenheit. Here's the proof. When they flew through, the temperatures here got over 30 Celsius in the eye. Pressure was low, winds were fast on the eye wall, 30 Celsius. My point, hurricane eyes are clear because of descending air, compressional warming that promotes evaporation, and it's warm in the hurricane eye, which means if you've ever gotten one, you're not going to freeze. It'll be warm and nice and pleasant. So I don't know why they screwed this up so bad, but they did. Okay, let's take all of that and move forward. Some questions. Make sure you got this. What direction do the winds circulate in a hurricane in the northern hemisphere? We just covered this. Northern hemisphere hurricanes, what way do the winds circulate? Got your answer? I hope everybody said B, counterclockwise. Another question. If a hurricane in the northern hemisphere were heading to the north, on which side of the hurricane would you expect to find the fastest winds and greatest storm surge? Eastern, western, southern, or northern? Well, let's answer this one. Let's imagine here's the hurricane. So let's kind of draw this. There's the eye. It's moving in this direction. That's to the north. So north is here, south is here, east is here, and west is over here. Now remember, the hurricane winds are circulating counterclockwise. The right-hand side is over here, and that is the eastern side. So the fastest winds would be on the eastern side. Now, if you just made the hurricane go to the west, then it would be on the northern side. Make it go to the south, it would be on the western side. It's always 90 degrees to the right. See that? All right. Next question. This is going to be a little tougher. If a hurricane in the southern hemisphere were heading to the south, on which side of the hurricane would you expect to find the fastest winds and greatest storm surge? Eastern, western, southern, or northern? You think about it for a second. All right. Hurricane. Moving south. What direction do hurricanes spin in the southern hemisphere? Well, it's the opposite of the northern hemisphere. They spin clockwise. Where do the rotational winds add to the movement of the hurricane? On the left-hand side. Now, some of you are going, wait a minute, you just drew the X on the same side. No, no, no. It's moving this way. This is the left-hand side of the hurricane. And that is also the eastern side. Now, if this is confusing, go back, watch this part of the video again. Make sure that you got this down, okay? All right, my last question. At which stage is a name assigned to a tropical cyclone? Is it a disturbance, depression, tropical storm, or hurricane? Give me your answer. Think about it. Well, when it's a disturbance, we investigate it. When it's a depression, we give it a number. When it becomes a tropical storm, it gets a name. It keeps the same name when it becomes a hurricane. So the answer is C, tropical storm. All right, we're now prepared for these slides. If we want to make a hurricane, four ingredients. That's it. First ingredient, the ocean temperature must be warm. An enormous amount of research has gone into this to basically discover if you want to make a powerful hurricane, you got to at least have ocean surface temperatures over 81 degrees Fahrenheit. That's around 27, 28 degrees Celsius. Therefore, we are constantly monitoring temperatures of our ocean with satellite, infrared satellites, and buoys. And that's because hurricane strength is directly tied to sea surface temperature, SST. So when we make maps, see the map in the upper left, or upper right, I'm sorry? That color coding makes a shift right here, if you look, right here at 26 degrees. That's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We do that so we can see the extent of the ocean globally where we can produce hurricanes. And you can clearly see that it's this area. Too cold here, too cold here, and too cold too far to the north, okay? But this is the region that is warm enough during hurricane season to make them, 26. Now, it's kind of interesting. When hurricanes go through, they will often cool the water behind them. These are cold water trails from Jose and Maria when they went through. 
So that's because hurricanes extract an enormous amount of heat from the ocean surface. That's how hurricanes get their power. For those of you that have studied some, uh, some um, thermodynamics, hurricanes are large carno cycles, and they get their heat, they get their energy from the ocean surface. So they often leave these cold water trails behind them. The warmer the ocean temperature, the more powerful the hurricane can be. So because people know this, they've tried to modify the ocean. Get this, this is, this is no joke here. There have been three crazy proposals to the US government to help combat this. Are you ready? Number one, let's take some tugboats up here into the north, uh, into the Arctic, and tugboat down big giant chunks of ice and put them in the Caribbean, put them in the Gulf of Mexico, put them in the Western Atlantic. Why? Cool the ocean surface, can't make hurricanes. Problem, where are you gonna get a tugboat big enough to, chew, uh, to pull down a chunk of ice that big to keep it cool? The part of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, the West, it's, it's, it's huge. This is huge. And think about it like this. Hot summer day, fill the glass with ice, pour some tea into it, leave it outside on the porch for 30 minutes. Come back, ice is gone. The sun can outdo this at any point. So tugboating ice down here is stupid. What about this one? Heard a real proposal? Let's just nuke the thing. Nuke the hurricane. Drop a nuclear bomb in the middle of it. See what happens. You know what'll happen? The hurricane will eat it for breakfast. One nuclear bomb is nothing compared to the power of a hurricane. And nuclear weapons, when detonated, produce an enormous amount of heat. What do hurricanes need to survive? Heat. This is a horrible idea. The third and final idea we actually tried. There was a proposal to spread vegetable oil across the Gulf of Mexico. Why? Well, the oil and water separate, giving a barrier through which the water vapor cannot evaporate and get into the atmosphere to fuel hurricanes. Now, besides the ecological disaster of doing this, this is a horrible idea because where are you going to get that much vegetable oil? Well, I'll tell you where. We did it in 2010. Not on purpose, though. Deepwater Horizon, remember that ocean well? When it blew, it spread vegetable oil all over. That's all oil is. It's vegetable oil, right? Spread it all over the Gulf of Mexico. In the end, hurricanes didn't even care. The ocean's so choppy, and there wasn't enough oil there, that it still extracted heat from it, and we produced 21 named systems that year. So, even though this is the crucial ingredient, modifying these things is nearly impossible. In addition to this, you can't just have warm water. You gotta have water that extends down deep with warm water, maybe, you know, uh, 200 feet below the ocean surface. Think about it like this. You know, maybe it's, uh, maybe your friend or you have a pool or something. You know, in May, the first really warm day where it gets up to like 80 or 90, you're like, I'm gonna go swimming. So you put your swimsuit on, you go out there and you dip your toe into the water in the pool and the top layer is nice and warm. You dive in and you quickly find out that the water temperature down below the surface of your, or below the surface of your pool uh, is still like, I don't know, 40 and you freeze, you jump right back out. Hurricanes do the same thing. You can't just have warm surface water. It's got to be a deep layer of water. They extract heat from the ocean and make enormous waves that turn up a lot of cold water from below. Proof? Look at this. The track of Irma, Harvey, Katya, all of them extracted so much heat and churned up so much cold water that behind them it was hard to get another hurricane to form. So you got to have warm water, okay? Now, this is an interesting thing to look at. Research has shown since the 1960s, because of global climate change, the Earth's oceans are taking in about 90%, 90% of the additional heat in the Earth atmosphere system. And therefore, what we're doing with time is, we are increasing our global sea surface temperatures and our subsurface temperatures in the ocean. Best evidence, coral bleaching, or just looking at the temperatures. And you can see that that is gonna really have a dramatic effect in the long run on hurricane strength. Keep that in mind. Lastly, our last two ingredients. Next, we do not want to have strong wind shear. Now, what's wind shear? Wind shear is a change of wind speed in a direction with height. Wind shear is bad for hurricanes. It spreads out their heat and it can disrupt their rotation. Now, the hurricane itself spins violently, but it wants to do so in an environment, in other words, the surrounding air, that's very, very calm. It likes to sit there and spin all by itself. You see, we make maps like the one you see in the right, on the left-hand side here, sorry, that show us where there's high wind shear. In this particular case, there's a little hurricane right here, and it's gonna stay in this low wind shear environment. If it were to move into these warmer colors, sheared apart, gone, no, no hurricane. Some interesting research has been done about this. It turns out when there's an El Nino over in the Pacific Ocean, we tend to have high Atlantic wind shear. 
When there's a La Nina, low Atlantic wind shear. As a consequence, when there's an El Nino event, we tend to have fewer hurricanes. When there's a La Nina event, we tend to have more. We're going to study this more when we talk about El Nino, La Nina later this semester. And finally, our fourth ingredient, which is pretty easy, you got to be away from the equator must be more than four or five degrees north or south of the equator. Uh, you have no Coriolis force there to help the thing circulate, so you got to get away from the equator. So, warm sea surface temperatures, warm water below the ocean surface, no wind shear, get away from the equator. you got those things in place. Hurricanes can form. When they form, one other factor can control them that I'm just, I want to teach you today, and that's Saharan dust. You know, us way over here in the United States, we can often get dust from the Saharan Desert traveling all the way across the Atlantic. You might see it after a rain, as the when the rain evaporates on your car, you might have little dots of dust all over it. Sometimes that's Saharan dust. When these hurricanes chew on that dust, when they ingest that dust, it can sometimes shut them down. So we're always watching these big plumes of dust coming off the Saharan Desert, like you've been watching in this animation. Now I'm gonna show you how this all comes together. 2017 Atlantic hurricane season, 17 tropical storms, that's five more than normal. 10 hurricanes, normal is six. Six of those 10 hurricanes were major hurricanes, that's category three or stronger. Now, what's normal? Two. We had $300 billion in damage, mostly from Harvey, Irma, and from Maria. That's the number one most expensive hurricane season on record. What made it so active? Well, look here. Here we are, August 3rd, 2017. The main development region, we just learned this, right? The main development region for hurricanes I'm outlining right here. Warmer than average ocean temperatures. That's what the color scale tells us. Then, over on this side, we're looking at tropical Atlantic vertical wind shear. Normally, this black line tells you how wind shear changes throughout the year. Hurricane season starts here and ends about here. Normal wind shear, black line. Do you see how low the wind shear was? That's the blue line during the 2017 season. Low wind shear, warm ocean temperatures, far enough away from the equator, big time hurricane season. That's what it takes. Predicting these things though is very, very hard. When they happen, hurricanes have four major weapons at their disposal to kill you. Storm surge, inland flooding, high winds, and tornadoes. What we're looking at there in the upper right-hand corner is data from 1963 all the way to 2012. You can see that storm surge and freshwater flooding, that's rain, these two things are 80%, 80% 80 of all the fatalities are primarily from water. Flooding, storm surge. What is it? Storm surge is a rise in sea level. It's wind-blown water. It is not a tsunami. We'll see that in a moment. It only affects the coastline and it is the biggest killer in our data set here. Inland flooding. Sometimes hurricanes can drop over 50 inches of rain. Hurricane Mitch in 1998 dropped 52 inches of rain in just two days, killing 18,000 people in Central America. Inland flooding can be widespread. In between the years 1970 and 1999, it was the most deadly form of weather from hurricanes. High winds. Well, hurricane wind speeds can get over 200 miles an hour, but remember, they're primarily confined to the eye wall, which means when you see a large hurricane, remember that it's not everywhere under that cloud shield that you have hurricane force winds. It's mostly confined to the eye wall. And I'm not going to touch on this in this lecture, but hurricanes can also produce tornadoes. Yeah, that's right. A hurricane can spawn a tornado. They can often be very numerous. Uh, some hurricanes can produce hundreds of them, but they're often very weak. But it's very difficult to distinguish the tornado damage from the hurricane damage because they're both so damaging. So we're going to focus on storm surge, inland flooding, and high winds. Storm surge first. Storm surge is greatest on the right-hand side of the hurricane. Sometimes you can get sea level rise over 30 feet. What makes it worst? A bay or an inlet. And it can be enhanced by tides or the shape of the coastline. Now to see what storm surge looks like, check out this video. We're going to watch this point right here. This is from the National Hurricane Center. Storm surge is not like a tsunami. Storm surge is successive waves, wind-blown waves, where over a period of hours, sea level rises 5 to 30 feet. So it takes a long time. Storm surge isn't immediate. It takes a long time for it to form, each wave deeper than the one before it. And you can see in the simulation how each wave crashes a little bit higher than the one before it. That's what storm surge is, not a tsunami.
Look over here in the bottom left. I have a map of the wind speeds of Hurricane Katrina. Now when you look at it, where you see this uh, low value right in here, that's the eye of Katrina. Katrina was moving directly to the north. See the right hand side? Fastest winds. Left hand side? Slowest winds. Because of that, Katrina's greatest storm surge, I'm circling it right over here, was on the right hand side of the hurricane. But Katrina was able, as it approached from the south, to pump about an extra 10 feet of water into Lake Pontchartrain, which is why New Orleans flooded. Storm surge. Check this out. Mobile Bay, Alabama. Hurricane track number one. This track went to the left, to the west of Mobile Bay. Because the greatest winds and greatest storm surge are on the right-hand side, this would be the worst possible situation for Mobile Bay because the right-hand side would force the water into the bay. And because the bay is kind of funnel, like a funnel like this, you get massive concentrated storm surge. Track two, greatest storm surge, right-hand side near Pensacola. What happens to Mobile Bay in this situation? Well, because of the circulation around this big hurricane looks something like this, water can get drawn out of the bay. Now, let me show you this. Let me erase this real quick. Here are the storm surge maps from Katrina on the left and Camille on the right. Many people that lived in New Orleans thought, wow, we survived Hurricane Camille. It was a Category 5. We didn't get destroyed by Camille. I think we can survive Cat 3 Katrina. But the difference of about 40 miles in the inland, I'm sorry, in the um, lane falling track was all that it took. You see, that's the track of Camille over there on the right. This is the track of Katrina. Let me take Katrina's track and overlay it with Camille's. You see, Camille's storm surge was all concentrated here. It didn't feel like Pontchartrain. Katrina's track, 40 miles to the east, or to the west, did. And that's all that it took to bring all that destruction to New Orleans. Track is everything. Now, here was an interesting thing. You saw this earlier in the in lectures on hurricanes. Tampa Bay, which is right here, instead of having storm surge, because the hurricane made landfall to the south, the water was actually drawn out of the bay. You see, the winds here were offshore. And instead of having surge coming in, the winds go out. So, and very important to always know the track and pay attention to the wind speed and direction. So I got a question for you. Of the cities listed below, in your opinion, which city is at the greatest risk of life and property loss due to storm surge? Big cities here, Houston, Texas, Louisiana, or New Orleans, Louisiana, Tampa, Florida, Miami, Florida, or New York City, New York. What do you think? Well, I made this list because these are the five large cities that I will never live in. And this is why. Check out this map I made. See the yellow? That's everywhere along the east coast and the southern coast of the United States where we are 30 feet or below in elevation. Houston, Texas, 5.5 million people in the metro area that live between zero and 43 feet above sea level. Again, we've seen Hurricane Ike, the Galveston hurricane, destroy life and property there. That's number five on my list. Number four, New Orleans, Louisiana, 1.4 million in the metro area. Most of them live between one and 15 feet below sea level. Katrina proved that disaster. Number three, whoops, number three, Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida, if a hurricane ever takes a track that goes to the north of Tampa like this, the right-hand side of the hurricane shoves water in Tampa Bay, you've got nearly 3 million people that live between 0 and 5 feet above sea level. If a hurricane takes the track that I just drew there, we might see our first trillion-dollar weather disaster. Miami, number two. Hurricanes come in like this all the time. Normally, the Bahama Islands serve as barrier islands, knocking some of the strength out of hurricanes. But if one goes just to the south of Miami, the right-hand side comes in like this. 5.5 million people that live between 0 and 3 feet above sea level. Oh, and sea level's rising there, making it even more vulnerable. But you want to know what number one is? I don't want a hurricane to ever do this. Long Island. 8.8 .8 of New York City's 18.8 million people. 8.8 million people along Long Island. There's just a few bridges and a few tunnels to get them off. You send out a mandatory evacuation for Long Island, there'll be traffic jams, accidents, and no one will get off the island. In the middle, it's got a pretty high crest, but most of the people live between about 0 and 30 feet above sea level. 
Now, the only way that I will ever live on Long Island is if I'm able to live way out here in the Hamptons. And if I lived out here, it'd be great. I'd have a helicopter. I'd just fly away when there's a hurricane. <laughs> but these are the cities that I think are most vulnerable. Think about it. Let's talk about inland flooding next. When you think about inland flooding, the worst situation is a slow-moving hurricane. If that slow-moving hurricane hits a location with a lot of terrain and poor land management, flooding is going to happen and it's going to be disastrous. There are two places on earth that I am terrified to live in because of hurricanes and typhoons and cyclones. It's Haiti and Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Bangladesh is the size of the state of Illinois. Illinois has 13 million people. Bangladesh, I think, has like 140 million people. And in Illinois, uh, you know, if we have problems, even though the states may not like us that well, Iowa, Wisconsin, Missouri, Michigan, Indiana, they'd all take us in if we had a problem. Bangladesh's neighbors, the Southeastern Asian uh, countries, India, not a chance, which means they can't evacuate very anywhere when these things hit. And when they hit, massive flooding. Haiti's number two. And the problem with Haiti is, when hurricanes hit, look at the deforestation that has happened on the Haitian side of the island compared to the Dominican Republic. Because of that, there's no tree roots to hold the, the soil in place. There are massive mudslides and landslides with every major landfalling hurricane there, causing untold number of deaths. Haiti is incredibly vulnerable because of that. Now, hurricanes, remember, can track pretty far inland too. Katrina came in here and dropped a foot of rain, but then continued to produce rain all the way up here into New York State. So Hurricane Katrina is pretty fast moving, but you can see it dropped a lot of rain as it moved inland. The worst situation is when they stop, sit, and spin like Hurricane Harvey. So poor land management, plus lots of terrain, slow-moving hurricane, you're in trouble. Let's talk about high winds. What are they caused by? The strong pressure gradient. Remember, they're strongest on the right-hand side. So if you see this image of a hurricane, I put a diagram down here on the bottom that kind of shows us how the hurricane wind speeds change as you go through the hurricane. You see, on the right-hand side over here, these winds are faster than they are on the left-hand side. There's zero in the middle of the hurricane down here, and I kind of drew a dash line to show you the middle. They're not too strong once you get past these two points. So it's really only in here in the eye wall that they're strongest. So hurricane wind speed increasing on the y-axis here reaches a peak. So if you're outside of this area, more than about 50 to 100 miles away from the center of the hurricane, these winds out here are not hurricane strength. It's only the winds inside the eye wall, inside this ring I just drew, that they're fast. Now, when the winds come spiraling inward, they have to increase by the conservation of angular momentum, which means as you decrease your radius, the wind speeds or the rotational speed has to go faster. Then when they get to the middle, the winds spiral their way up and exhaust out aloft. So that's kind of the 3D structure of the hurricane. Next, check out this video. This is uh, from Naples. Watch what this guy's going to do. Here he is, Naples, Florida, Hurricane Irma jumps out of the car with a handheld anemometer and he is trying to stand in 117 mile an hour winds. You know, a lot of us have experienced thunderstorm winds and yeah, they can be fast and destructive, but they're brief. 20, 30 minutes of severe winds. Hurricanes produce strong straight line winds like this that last for hours. Oh, and then they switch directions. That's what causes so much damage and destruction. All right, I want to give you a quick note about palm trees as we finish this up. Palm trees are designed to withstand hurricane force winds. So the lesson is, if you live in a location with palm trees, if the palm trees have been knocked over and destroyed, you know that you were in a location that had an incredibly powerful hurricane. So we finish this up, let's talk about watches and warnings. What's a hurricane watch? Well, the National Hurricane Center issues them. And hurricane watch, that means either tropical storm or hurricane conditions are expected in a coastal area within the next 48 hours. They upgrade that to a warning if they expect those things to happen in the next 36 hours. So we've been talking a lot about Ike. Here is the path of Ike. And we can see we had hurricane watch here because it was issued on Thursday. Saturday, 48 hours away we can see here that we had a watch up. We had a tropical storm warning over for this area. I mean, we were gonna experience tropical storm force winds within 48 hours. So it kind of shows you how powerful Ike was. When it comes to hurricane forecasting, let's go back to this topic of ensemble forecasting. Left-hand side first. When Harvey was here, getting ready to move across the Yucatan Peninsula, we simulated a whole bunch of different ways of looking at Harvey. 
what we did is we found this pretty large envelope here of possibilities. So what we can do is we can take the average of all these simulations and assume that the hurricane's probably gonna follow pretty close to it, which in this case went very, very close to Houston. Ensemble forecasting, again, is a method where we either use a lot of different models or different um, iterations of the same model to predict the path of a hurricane. Now, how does the National Hurricane Center do it? Well, it predicts a central path of the hurricane using these ensemble forecasts and then draws a cone around it. Now, that cone has a width, and the width of that cone is determined by the historical track error at different time intervals. And over uh, the last 40 plus years, really almost 50 years, the historical track error for both the 24 hour, the 90, you know, all the way up to 120 hours. So let's look at all these has been decreasing, which means we're getting better and better and better. So when they produce these cones, which you should be monitoring all hurricane season long from the National Hurricane Center, their cone is related to hurricane track error. That's how they get it. All right, last thing I wanna show you here, Patricia. Remember this, hurricanes can come out of the Pacific Ocean, cross Mexico and get into uh, the US. Look at all the different ensemble forecast uh, members here from Patricia. It was forecast to eventually hit uh, Texas. When it did, they were expecting at least 10 inches of rain in eastern Texas, and they got it, and there was massive flooding. Finally, I want to review this with you. When a hurricane forms, don't forget this. Here we're looking at Super Typhoon Sotolor. It was headed toward the southeastern coast of China. Now, as it was getting close to Taiwan, I want you to focus in on that star, so listen up. If the hurricane in its forecast track by the National Hurricane Center produced a cone like this, what would be the difference if it went down track one versus track two? Which would produce the more severe conditions for the location marked with the star? Got your answer? It is most definitely track two. You see the hurricane's right hand side slams into the star if the center of the hurricane follows track two. Track one, the wind speeds are going offshore, track two, onshore. Greatest storm surge, fastest winds, track two, hits the star. And I guess I have one more thing to show you. We've seen in movies sometimes that hurricanes can combine to make massive hurricanes. That doesn't really happen. We actually get what's called the Fujiwara effect. Now think about it, if you have two hurricanes both spinning in the same direction like this, if they were to come together, they would counteract their spin, they would collide and destroy one another. So what do they do? They orbit one another, with one hurricane going that way and the other one going this way. And they just orbit around one another around a large central area right in through here, and it's called the Fujiwara effect, named after the person that discovered it. So we had two long lectures on hurricanes, but you now know how they form, why they spin, why the track is so important, what the most deadly aspects of them are, and how they destroy stuff. And that's what I wanted you to walk away from these lectures understanding. So with that, we're going to wrap up our lectures on tropical cyclones.